Thank you, Gabe. You love me, don't you? Hey. Thank you, Pastor Don, for letting me borrow the pulpit. I know it is a great privilege and honor and something that is not taken lightly. I want to talk to you guys this morning, the second part of radical forgiveness. It's the first to forgive. Who is the first person? When we start this trek in our Christianity and when we set out to live a life just for Jesus, who is the first person to forgive? We're going to talk about that today. It's a very difficult message to deliver. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to stand here in front of you and reveal some personal things and some things that brought me to this point. It's a very difficult thing I had not even told my husband. I had not even told Pastor Don what the Lord had said. These four words that the Lord had said to me. I had not even told him. Um, I was actually going to preach at a woman's, a battered woman's shelter. And he'd come to listen. And he actually heard it from there first. Because it is nothing you'll read about in Scripture. Um, there's not a Bible story about it. Usually you can pinpoint things that the Lord will do or say from Scripture. But there's not. We're going to talk about Job and Joseph. These two men probably got the roughest end of what the Lord can do. The Lord will do as he pleases. The Lord is sovereign. But poor old Job and Joseph, they had a hard life. They had it rough. We're going to go to Job 38 and talk about what the Lord had said. Pastor Don, pray for me. I will. We're going to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. That's just a stand. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to Job 38, 4 through 18. We should have them up there on the screen. It skips around. But Job sort of got on a pity party. Um, if you read Job from the beginning to the end, uh, over half of it is Job and his friends on a pity party wondering, why the Lord don't help me? What have I done to deserve this, Lord? Why was I ever born, Lord? He sort of got on a pity party, him and his friends. And they even began theorizing about the Lord. And that was not what the Lord wanted from Job. The Lord had been in heaven with all of his angels talking about this great man of God. Oh, Job is my great man of God. He is the greatest in the land. And then like most of us kids do, Job really aggravated the Lord with his reaction to this thing that was going on in his life. But the Lord spoke up to Job. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Where were you when I had laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves hopped. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. 
Job 38, 24 and 25, it says, What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorms? 34 and 35 goes on to say, Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. And then the Lord finally told Job in 740, verse, chapter 40, verse 7 and 9, he says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like this? You guys can be seated. Now that is the Lord. That is the Lord God Almighty. That's who he is. That's where he's from. That's what he can do. And then Joseph. In Genesis 45, Joseph said to his brothers when he finally revealed himself to them and they come into the courts of the throne room, Joseph told his brothers, it was not you who sent me here, but God. But I can say this. I can say this for Job. Job 1.22, it says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job never blamed the Lord. He did not sin in that matter. But was that really what the Lord wanted? Because it was the Lord that did that to Job. He allowed that to happen. It was the Lord that allowed Joseph to go through what he went through. It was the Lord that allowed me or you or any of us to step through life and the things happen to us that happen. Yes. It was the Lord. I've always realized that. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it says, if you speak in tongues of angels, if you have the gift of prophecy and fathom all mysteries and knowledge, if you have the faith to move mountains, if I give all my possessions to the poor, but do not have love, I have nothing. I gain nothing, I have nothing. If you do not have love, I'm here to tell you, this message is about love, too. We have to have love to forgive. And we've got all these scriptures in Matthew and Luke and Mark that tells us to forgive. And then in Proverbs 13, 17 and 9, it tells us that if you do not forgive and dwell on that thing, it will separate close friends. It ruins friendships. You cannot move forward. There's a wall there of separation. But who's the first to forgive? <coughs> Love one another, church. Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? And what did Jesus say? Peter said, you know I do. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? And Peter said, Lord, yeah, I love you. On the third time, Peter was a little bit disturbed. Yeah. And he continued to tell him, Feed my sheep. You know that to feed sheep, particularly sheep like us, a flock like this, human sheep, before you can tell 
anybody anything, before you can really benefit anybody, they have got to know that you love them. They've got to know that you love them. All the spiritual gifts in the world that you have is nothing. Everything that you give away is nothing. The time that you pay is nothing if you do not love one another. It equals nothing. But who, who do we forgive first? Who do we forgive first? I'm going to tell you a little bit about my testimony. It's very difficult. Sometimes it's like talking about somebody else. Uh, sometimes if you hear me talk about the previous joy, if you asked my daughter sitting here, her and I grew up together. I was 18 when I had her. If you asked her, well, you know, mama before, she's seen the transformation. And she knows what her mother come from. When I was 22 years old, I had married my high school sweetheart, Brittany Cullen's dad. I had two children. Um, we had our whole lives ahead of us. And he dropped dead in front of me. I couldn't bring him back. I was a nurse. I couldn't bring him back. I did CPR, I did CPR, I just dialed 911 and I said, come and get him, he's dead. That's all that could come out of my mouth. I did CPR, I did CPR, I did CPR until they got me. And I heard the ambulances and the police and the fire trucks coming up the road and they swooped me up. I remember it, they swooped me up and they pulled my body back and set me in a rocking chair. And when my body hit the rocking chair, my soul came out. And I could see them running tubes down him and continuing CPR and shocking him and trying to bring him back and his body just hurled. Everything in it was just coming out. I seen all this. I still have dreams about it. It shook me like Nothing else could. It broke me. My heart was in a million pieces. I was not the same. I did not care about life. But now when it first happened, the very first thing that came to my mind was, oh, there is not a God. I'm just being honest with you guys. I'm being completely honest. I'm telling you that. That was my first thought when that happened. I thought there is not a God. There is not a God that would take him from me. There is not a God that would leave me here with two little kids to raise by myself. There is not a God this heartless. I did. Mean, I thought for certain there was no God. And then right behind that I thought Leave me alone, God. Because while I was thinking there was no God, God had me in the palm of his hand. Just trying to hold on. Just trying to keep me from drowning. And I could feel him. Oh, I could feel him. My mother and father and I taught me going into a church service one night. Right after this happened. And the Holy Spirit was on the back of my neck. My neck felt like it was on fire. Every hair on my arms and head was standing on end for me to go and submit to him that he was real, that he still had me in the palm of his hand, but I would not submit. I would not submit. You know what I did? For about four years, for about four years, 
I cursed the Lord. I said, I hate you, God. How could you do this to me? You're heartless. Look at my children. They cry out for their daddy. What have you done to me? Look at me. You took the only thing besides my kids that love me in earth. Where are you? My life was miserable every day of my life. I cried. I did drugs. I sold drugs. I stole cars. You would not believe the joy that that created. It was something else. I couldn't go back to nursing. I lost my career. I was not the same person. But I want you to tell, I want you to know that God had me in his hand and over me through it all. No matter how hard that I run, no matter what that I did, no matter how much that I wanted to push him away and I wanted to just wither up and die, he does not relent. His love Amen. is unending. Amen. It's unfathomable, unimaginable. Yes. Amen. And I have got a testimony that it, that is weird too because I cannot remember a point where I said, oh yes, Lord, I'm saved and I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and uh, I know him and I want a relationship with him now. That's not mine and the Lord's relationship. I know that it is for most, and that's how the Bible depicts that the relationship is supposed to go. I know. But mine and the Lord's relationship is not like that. From a little girl, he was always with me. I was by myself most of the time, raised myself most of the time. So he was always with me from birth, from my earliest memories. I can remember things that he would say to me or things that he would do. It's just that I know when I, when I fully submitted. I know when I said, all right, Lord, I give up. I'm yours. Take this broken vessel and use me. Use me. This thing. This thing. I remember that point. Nope. Not necessarily the salvation. I just remember when I fully submitted. So God has always spoke to me. Spoke to me things that are not exactly normal for all the rest of the Christians and his children. Spoke to me things that I did not know. I just thought that they happened to everybody. I ran a daycare for a couple of years. And we had a little lady, she was 70, Carmela. We loved her dearly. She would come on Thursdays and she would hold babies for me all day and work with me. So I did not know this. I thought that this was normal. And Pastor Don knew this about me, but he never did know the magnitude of why, really. But I love bumblebees. I love bumblebees. They've never stung me. They're a friend of mine. They're like petting a little doggy. Oh, little bumblebee. So everywhere I go, there's bumblebees, usually if I'm outside for any extended period of time. So outside where we fed the kids on sunny days, there was a bumblebee nest. And the bumblebees would swim around the kids and everything. And, and I would have to tell them, to, at the beginning, I would have to start saying, don't swat at the bumblebees. They don't sting. Don't swat at the bumblebees. They don't sting. And nobody had ever told me any different. And Sister Carmella looks at me and says, are you crazy? Those bumblebees hurt and they will sting these kids. Amen. And I thought, 
Really? How do you know that? And she said, I've been stoned before. Both of these hurt. And I still said, well, just don't swat them. They're different around me. But I asked the Lord about it. Because it concerned me, I thought, Lord, what is, I could not remember. And he spoke just as sweetly to me. And he said, child, do you not remember in those meadows and those wildflowers? I sent the bumblebees to play with you. They'll never sting you. My heart ran into my shoe. Because he's always had his hand on me. He's always been there. There's never a time that he's not. When I do wrong, he tells me when with my boisterous and bossy and loud ways, say something off the wall. He lets me know. There's no getting away from him. Go ahead. So I just submitted. I just submitted. Two years later, I met Pastor Dawn to strengthen that relationship. But probably about three years ago, we have a Audubon in Tennessee. You guys know about it? An Audubon highway where you can drive real fast. Okay, Pastor Sean's shaking his head. Yeah, that's news to me. Okay, he'll remember once I jog his memory. So in our little town in Maribel, Alcoa, there, they built a new road called Pellissippi Parkway. We call it Pellissippi Speedway. <laughs> and it is just a straight, brand new, smooth highway that connects, it goes to West Knoxville, uh, you know, Oak Ridge, and they're gonna build it all the way out to where it hits Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. But I had worked down that highway, I went to school down that highway before, so, I was making my trek to school one morning. It may be four years ago now, but it was three or four years ago. And I, and I just, if you don't go 85, yes, 85, <laughs> ask Sister Kelsey. If you don't go 85, you better be in the far right-hand lane and out of the way. Some little old ladies just wouldn't get their car up to that fast so they couldn't ride on Pelosi Parkway. They'd be like, oh, I gotta take a detour. They just wouldn't even do it. So 85 is the acceptable speed on our Pella City Speedway. So I'm taking that road. And when I take that road, I've got the worship music on and I'm just worshiping and I'm just praising the Lord. And the Lord says, it almost caused me to wreck on the speedway. I had to pull over. And the Lord says these four little words to me. He says, do you forgive me? Help me, Lord. That God that commands the thunder to tell him when a lightning bolt is coming, that God that stretched the expanse of the earth over nothing. Yeah. That God that told Job, man up. That God that owes me no apology. That God that did nothing wrong to me. He is not a man that he could sin or do wrong to me. That God asked me, do you forgive me? And I knew exactly what I, I was going like this on Pell City Speedway. I almost wrecked. I had to pull over. I had to, this car was shaking. I had to stop so quick. Because I knew what he meant. I knew what he meant. I knew that all those nights that I said, I hate you. What have you done to me? I hate you. I cannot recover from this, Lord. I hate you. Why have you taken him? God, I don't even know if he was saved or not. The thing that bothers me, the thing that God let happen to me, I knew what he was saying to me. Yeah. 
to me. Do you forgive me? You're not going to read about that in a Bible story. I've never seen anybody write it down. I've never seen it on a preaching site. I've tried to hunt it. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, this is, this is not right. This is not what I'm hearing. But I understand now the importance of that. Because ever since he said that to me, and I cried out to him, and I said, oh, God, I forgive you. I knew that I should have forgiven him first. Because it forever changed my relationship with him. And you say, Sister Joy, how did your relationship get any better? You've heard him from a child. You've known him. You've had special things happen and everything. Yes, but just like the scripture says in Proverbs 17 and 9, it says that love prospers where forgiveness happens. And if you yeah. dwell on it, it separates close friends. What closer friend do you have than Jesus Christ? Yeah. Amen. There was still a little bit of some trust issues. Well, I trust you with this, but I, I don't, I'll, do, I'll do that, Lord. I'll do that, Lord. Next, next. Okay, never mind, Lord. Or I can't ask you for that, Lord. That's too much. Or, do you really know the desires of my heart? Do you really have the best intentions for me, Lord? I always had that tiny bit of a wall that separated me and the Lord's relationship. The first to forgive is Him, church. And it's a deep, and it's a personal thing. It's nothing that I can explain. It's nothing that I can explain and put into words other than to tell you this story and to tell you those four words that I heard from God and how it deepened and changed my relationship with him. Yes. Is that I asked you that you forgive him. You forgive him. Just like forgiveness is, we don't have to get, do you forgive me from somebody to forgive them? And sometimes I've done it myself. I've said to people, well, God, Lord, Jesus, forgive me. And I'm not doing anything wrong to them. It's just I don't want no separation from close friends or people that I need to love. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so I many times said, forgive me. But it's what the Lord intends for your relationship with him, too. That you forgive him. That you totally let go. That you don't dwell on things in the past that's happened. That you just know that he's a sovereign God. That he is that God that calls the thunder to tell him when lightning's coming. Oh, I got a message. God is in the thunder. And this just sparked it on even more. But that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. And now with Jesus, somebody told me yesterday, and my heart's grieved about it. Somebody told me yesterday, because I've been there where they've been. They told me, they said, well, I think that I've went through enough hardship. And, and, and I think that I've been disciplined enough. I think that the Lord's whipped me enough in life that I paid for my sins. Oh, God. Yes. We do not. Get what we deserve. Amen. Amen. We don't get what we deserve. The heart stitched, the Lord stitched and circumcised together back my heart inside 
to the different person that I am today. And he continues to mend it back and fix it back and add some stuff and take away some stuff. But he's not going to do it unless you let him. First John 2, 1 through 2, it says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. So it doesn't matter what you do. Pastor Donald. Tyler, come up here. Keep in mind what I just said. Keep in mind what I just said. This is how it goes. This is how it goes. We've got the Father, the Son. We've got the sinner, us. Here we are. Here we are with our pitiful selves. I'll send up. No way to pay for it. No way to make amends. And we cry out, Abba, Father, forgive me for my sins. God, forgive me for my sins. And Jesus, the Son, Jesus, the Son, that shed every drop for you, the only one that could, the only one that had it to pay and had never sinned, the spotless lamb, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I hear my child. Okay, all right. Hold on just a minute. He taps on the Father. Tap on the Father. Tap on the Father. He's our advocate. He's our propitiation of our sins. He says, Father, have mercy on him. I died. My blood will cover this sin. Father, can you forgive them now? And the Father says, yes, son, you paid the price. Tell them they're forgiven. And then Jesus, the Son, looks down on us. It's for the whole world and says, You're forgiven, my child. Amen. I put it as far as the east is from the west. And just like our bulletin board out here that says he drops it into the depths of the sea, it is no more. It is, he's got even a sixth sense that says, I forget it. He forgets it. 